السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله. First of all, how are you? How are everyone? I have learned the American language. الحمد لله. It's been a bit tough. There is actually a theory that one of the UK comedians has about the difference between English and American. So he says, for example, like he realized that the difference is that Americans are more concise when they speak their language. For example, in the UK, what we walk on the road is called the pavement. But here in America, we call it the sidewalk. Because the Americans needed to know where to walk on the road. Not a sidewalk. In the UK, what you wear on your eyes, we call it glasses. But in America, they call it eyeglasses. Because they were worried you might put the glasses somewhere else. So, you know, they, had, they had needed to know where it is. <laughs> Jokes aside, you can tell I miss home. First of all, thank you very much, everybody, for being here. It's a bigger crowd than I expected. I actually thought this would be a smaller room, so I'll have to complain to the organizers. Jazakum Allah khair for turning up. This particular topic with regards to maintaining your identity when you're engaged in your activism, in terms of moving forward. And there are two ways we could approach it. And I spent quite a while discussing with my mother, who came here from the UK, and she's sitting here, hashtag no pressure. But <laughs> my mother came here, we were discussing this for a while, you know, in the morning over breakfast and the like, browsing through different ideas. And the reality is that it's not really worth lecturing people who are, mashallah, who've made such a great difference, going out to the encampments, protesting and the like. I don't think you need any encouragement in that regard, and it's not for me to lecture you in this. So rather instead, the poet Buna Muhammad, and I always quote this in my speeches because I love his poetry, the Canadian Muslim poet Buna Muhammad, or the Muslim Canadian poet, he says, we are all reflections true, so I can't talk about me without talking about you. Meaning that I can only give you a series of reflections that I've seen around the world, and perhaps you might resonate with one of them that might make sense within your context. So I will not be arrogant enough to assume that I know your context, but I will proceed to give some thoughts and ideas of things that I've seen. Maybe you will resonate with one of them. The reality is that I grew up in a household where we were taught that the Ummah was strong. I grew up in a household where the stories they would tell us were the stories of my grandfather, Ammar Gamadi, who would go to the mountains and fight against the French in the belief that his efforts would lead to the liberation of Algeria. I grew up in a household with a father who kept going activist from his student days, imprisoned at 19, tortured at 19, imprisoned again at 20, had a sentence of 25 years on his head when he was 21, and then fled the country and went to London and proceeded to volley criticism at the governments from there. And in, two, in 2001 or 2000, the French press, the, the, the media, La Presse, it wrote that a small brick building in the middle of London shakes the government of Ben Ali. I grew up in a household in which there was a constant activism moving forward. So I grew up in where I saw the fruits of that activism. I saw the difference that it made. But I'm not here to tell you about the tactics that were used. I'm here to tell you about the identity that underpinned that particular activism. I understand that in the context that this is being presented, it's being presented the idea of how do we participate in encampments when LGBT are there? How do we participate in encampments when leftists and socialists are there? I'm pointing at the brothers because sisters seem to have no problem. Sisters are going, mashallah. It's the brothers who are lacking behind. In any case, what is it that makes, what is it about them that makes the issue of going to encampments a complicated issue? And I realize it's the fear of losing an identity or compromising on an identity. And when I saw that was the problem, it led me to the conclusion that we don't really understand the identity because if we did, we would not hesitate to go to the front lines of any battlefield with which it is to protect Palestine and to stand up for justice, to stand up for Gaza. If we understood our identity, we would have recognized that those people on the front lines, non-Muslims, standing up for Gaza and Palestine, they are standing there not because they believe it's some cool issue, it's because there's a fitra that Allah put in their hearts that is now resonating so deeply with the issue they don't know what this fitra is. They are trying to find the word to describe it. We know what that word is. If their fitra is roaring, this is fertile da'wah territory. This is the time when you go and you speak to them because their fitra is alive. This is the time when you share the deen and you share the stories because the fitra is alive. But because we are not assured of our identity, we fear they would influence us as opposed to us influence them. And that's why we didn't rush to go and join those protests and encampments in the way perhaps that we should have. So in this particular talk I will focus on the concept of identity and the reality is that once upon a time I also thought that the Ummah in some respects could be weak as well you would see all the news and all the headlines about all the tragedies that are taking place and the like then 
when I was 17, my father was a bit worried that I might go wayward. So my father put a book in my hand called The Road to Mecca by Muhammad Asad. And the book Road to Mecca was a book that changed my life. Because in this book, Muhammad Asad, he seamlessly merged the politics of the day with Islam. And he didn't separate the two, nor did he ever say the two were separate. He made them seem the same. Muhammad Asad in his book Road to Mecca established maxims that it's not Muslims that make Islam great, it's Islam that makes Muslims great. He argues that when Islam inspires the Muslims to action, Allah gives them glory. But when Islam is just becomes a series of habits and rituals, then Allah removes the glory. For then the Muslims become like a Dajjal, one eye, in which for them Islam is the spiritual and personal. It's no longer the public and what you do in public and the like. But the book Road to Mecca by Muhammad Asad also taught me the stories of the past that helped to mold the identity. And I want to tell you some of these stories. I want to pass on some of these anecdotes. Ibadallah, when I was 18, we played football or, or soccer, as you guys call it here. After the first season, we came second in the league and we won one of the cup competitions. So on the way back from the bus, one of the members of the team says, why don't we go play against universities abroad? So we said, yeah, it's a great idea. They'll fundraise. They started cleaning cars during the summer. My father initially said, you can't go. And then two weeks before, he said, Sammy, you should go. I messaged the captain. I said to the captain that what do I need to pay to join this trip? He said, pay for your ticket from London to Istanbul and back. Everything inside Turkey is paid for. I said, are you sure? He said, yes. The night before I'm about to fly, my mother, she comes to me. She says to me, Sammy, I don't think you should go. I said, why, Ma? She said, I saw a dream that a man in a long chin threw you in the bathroom and locked the toilet on you, locked the door of the bathroom on you. I said to her, Ma, what kind of dream is this? But I knew who she was talking about because our captain had a long chin. So I told this story to her friends and we went to Istanbul. One thing you realize is that when you're in university or college, as you guys call it here, <laughs> I speak American, see? Translation <laughs> for free, you know, mashallah. I'm making life easier for the translators for the language. They are different languages, trust me. <laughs> when we, one thing you realize is when you're in the university environment, it's easy to get along when you're playing football. It's easy to get along. You know, you score the goal, whatever, you go have dinner after, it's fine. Or Umar ibn Khattab said, when you travel with people, it's very different. Or Umar Khattab once said to somebody, bring me somebody who knows you. He said, have you traveled with him? He said, no. Have you dealt money with him? He said, no, but I've drink coffee with him every night. He said, go away, you don't know him. The first day was okay. The first day was, oh, what do you say in your prayers? Oh, it sounds nice. Oh, really? Is that what you say about God? What's the relation with God? The second day was, you think you're better than us, don't you? The third day, they wanted to go clubbing. And I said to them, guys, guys, don't go. They said, no, you can't impose our views on, your views on us. You can't impose your views. I said, guys, who goes clubbing the night before a match? They said, Sammy, is it from your Islam or are you worried about the match? I said, yes, CD, I'm worried about the match. They said, okay, we won't go. And they went back to the hotel. A friend of mine came to me on the third night and said to me, Sammy, check if they've booked your ticket for the domestic flight from Istanbul to Van. I said, what do you mean, check? He said, check, maybe they haven't booked it. I said, you do know the alternative is they leave me stranded in Istanbul. So I went and they hadn't booked the ticket. So the guy captain says to me, get the team together and they'll vote on it. So they voted 15 to 5 to leave me stranded in Istanbul. And I was worried if I call my dad, my dad would tell me come home because I don't want to leave my son stranded there. So I didn't tell him about it. So the Turkish translator is walking and he says, brother, mashallah, you know, this is first time I see democracy, you know, like this in, in ordinary issues. I said, Ali, do you know what they just voted for? Brother, my English is not really that good. You know, I didn't understand. You guys all speak too fast. I said, they voted to leave me stranded in Istanbul. He said, these people. How dare they? He used the more harder term, but we can't use it on camera in America. But in any case, he said, don't worry, brother, I will look after you. He paid for the ticket. We went to Van. When we went to Van, we landed and we're driving back from the lake. It's a lake where Salah al Ayyubi, he stopped on his way to Al-Aqsa. As we're driving, there's a Kurdish driver called Naji. He's driving the car and he says something in Turkish to the translator. He says, why is this boy not eating the food that we're giving him? The Turkish translator says, he's fasting. He says, they fast in London. He said, yeah. So he talks in Turkey. He says, okay, tell him iftar is in my house. I told the brother, I said, listen, if we do iftar in his house, the team, I'm already on tough tensions with them. If they know that I'm getting special treatment, they will really, really hate me and it will be 
be very difficult. So it turns out the Turkish translator is not translating what I've said. He's, I can hear him say Istanbul and Kefara and this and the like. And this. So I'm like, subhanAllah, he's probably telling him the story of Istanbul. And the Kurdish guy is speeding up the car, accelerating, getting angry and angry as he's holding the steering wheel. And I'm like, Ya Latif, ya, what are you doing? So he says, Wallahi, Billahi, Tillahi, da na 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 in the language. And the Turkish translator goes, Brother, he says, Iftar in his house and you stay in his house. <laughs> When I went that evening and I went and stayed, the whole city found out that an 18-year-old boy from London was screwed over by his team in Istanbul. So they gave me a three-bedroom flat all to myself while the team stayed in dormitories. They brought me suhoor and iftar every single day. When the team went to the masjid and they met the imam, the imam was celebrating, said, we have London, Ramazan, fasting, Muslim, and this. So the team, they said, guys, have you met Sami before? They said, no. And he said, so why do you treat him this way? And the imam, wallah, he looks at the team and says, Allah, make ummet, one ummet. Sami, brother, brother, Sami, ummet after Sami. I was 18 years of age. When I got married, I took my wife on the honeymoon to this city. She told me people go Malaysia, people go Turkey. I'm going to Van in Eastern Turkey by the lake. I said, Wallahi, it's a special place. The next year, we decided to go to Ghana and Nigeria. So this time on the plane, at that time I didn't like flying. Now much better, now I sleep on planes. But at that time, I would think, oh, my debt's all paid, do the shahada 20 times and this, because this hunk of mud can't go. So there was a black activist with us who came and sat next to me. He said to me, Sami, Islam is racist. I said, don't start this now, just before a hour flight to Accra. I said, I might accept that Muslims can be racist, but Islam is not racist. I might accept Muslims, but Islam is not racist. I said, the Muslim who is racist is a jahil and doesn't follow the deen as it should be followed. Bluntly. Because Bilal Barabah, he said, you always use Bilal. I said, no, you're saying that because you don't appreciate Bilal. Bilal Barabah was put on that desert floor in the heating desert. Rock on his chest being whipped. All he had to do was give up. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. He refused to do so, said Ahadun Ahad. But not from a position of weakness. The reason they were beating him was they felt if the slaves saw his resilience, they would do a revolt and topple the leaders of Quraysh. He was a man of revolution, not some weak slave that some Muslims believe him to be. When it comes to, so he starts talking to me and I said to him, listen, I'm not in the mood for this, but I promise you, when we go to Ghana, Nigeria, those black African brothers will resonate more with me than they will with you. He said, that's arrogant and offensive. I said, watch, Kazi. I was a bit of a brat when I was younger. <laughs> when we landed in Nigeria, we have a 12 hour transit to go to Lagos, to go to Accra in Ghana. So we haven't prayed Maghrib Isha. So me, Tayyib, Nigerian brother, Adnan, Bosnian brother, we decide to pray Maghrib and Isha together. Tayyib does the Iqama and I've gone, Allahu Akbar. I hear behind me, doo -doo 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 -doo. Allahu Akbar! I finish the taslim, I turn around, I see three rows, 25 Nigerians. <laughs> they look at brothers, where are you coming from? We told them we're from London. Masha, Muhammad, we have guests from London. Bring the food. They put it here. By the way, this black activist is a popular journalist now in the UK. He wrote his memoirs. In his memoirs, he wrote, this was the most powerful thing I had ever seen in my life. He asked the Nigerians, do you guys know each other? Nigerians said, we haven't met each other, but we don't need to. The brother, uh, the black, uh, black activist says, why? And wallahi al-azim, the Nigerians look him straight in the face and say, Allah create Muslims like one ummah, one brotherhood. These brothers from London are like family, even if we don't meet them. Have the food starts. Say Bismillah, brother. Stay Bismillah. And he goes and he looks and he says, it's the most powerful thing I ever saw. I was 19. I was 19 years of age. When we went to Accra, Ghana, we a football match starts at 4.30 and it ends at 6.30. 6.30 is Maghrib. The idiots in the team, let's say bluntly, they finished all the water and all the food by 6.30 and I've been fasting. It's humid. It's July. It's Ramadan. I'm sitting on the bus and I'm going, Allah, Allah, I should have taken the license. Why did I fast? Allah, like why? We got to drive like another 45 minutes to get to the next place. We're in the middle of nowhere. We're in Kumasi, you know, in, in, in Ghana and this and somebody not associated with the team. He runs onto the bus and he goes, hey, I heard there is somebody here. He's fasting. They said, yeah, he's sitting over there at the back. Hey, he's over here. They bring a big fat bowl of jollof rice with telapi and plantain. And they brought a big bottle of water. They put it and they said, say bismillah and eat. The black activist is sitting next to me. He looks at the guy and goes, what about me? And uqsimu billah. Can you guess what the brother said to him? He said to him, Allah created us as one ummah. He is my brother and I have to look after him. Eat my brother, have it and give me the reward in Jannah, inshallah. I said to him, I said, 
this ain't brother. If this ain't a sign for you from Allah, I don't know what is saying so if you don't want to burn, trust me. <laughs> the reason why I start with this before I get to the point of the activism is my identity was molded through those experiences. My identity was molded through these stories. It was molded through the framework I had at home through my parents, which was then allowed me to interpret these events as the power of the Ummah, which means that I knew what identity looks like. I went to the far ends of the earth, to random countries, and you would find a message, and you would find they would look after you. You realize this identity is unique, and non-Muslims do not have an equivalent. We take it for granted, but non-Muslims do not have an equivalent. And that's why when you know the Ummah, when you believe in the Ummah, when you see the Ummah, when you feel the Ummah, you don't give up on the Ummah and you start realizing the problem is not the Ummah is weak. The problem is you don't know the Ummah. The problem is you don't know the stories of the Ummah. The problem is you've never met the Ummah. The problem is you don't know what they've been going through and the like. I read Ezzed Begovic's book, Alia Ezzed Begovic, the Bosnian president, Inescapable Questions. So I wanted to go to Bosnia. And when my wife and I started Halal Travel Guide, the tour company, Bosnia was one of the first destinations that we did. After we started doing a few tours, one of the foreign ministries, they reached out to us and they said, why do you only do Sarajevo to Mostar. Why don't you do other parts of Bosnia? We said, look, we just don't have the resources. Like, it's a lot of money to trek across you know, Bosnia and the like. They said, we will pay for everything and just come and take a look at the other places. One of the cities on the list is a city called Banja Luka. For those who don't know, Banja Luka, Mladic entered it in 1993. This is when they committed the genocide and the like. There were 18 masajid in Banja Luka. They destroyed all 18 masajid. They turned them into garbage dumps. When the smell got too bad, they turned them into parking lots so they could always say they are stepping over Islam and that they conquered Islam. Before they entered Srebrenica, Mladic told the cameras, we're here to take revenge on the Muslims. This is a blessed day. And he proceeded to massacre 8,000 Bosnians. And those are the numbers that we know. Forget the numbers that we don't know. When I saw Banja Luka on this list, I said to Sumaya, I said to her, I ain't going Banya Luka. I'm not going to that place. I'm not disrespecting Shuhada. And the Velibor next to us, the Croat from the, from the government, he said, please just go check it out. We won't stay the night. I'm not going. Please go and stay the night. I'm not going. Please go stay the night. In the end, when they kept going back and forth, I said, listen, we go, we look and we leave. As we're going from Travnik, so you go from Travnik, and there's a joke about Bosnia that if Allah ayed it, it would be the size of the United States because it's just mountain up, mountain down, mountain up, mountain down, mountain up, mountain down. As you go round the mountain and you see Banja Luka, the first thing you see is a minaret. And I went, minaret in Banja Luka. So I walk in, the Imam comes out wearing a suit and everything. He comes out, he goes, before you can even speak, I'm like, Imam, what are you doing here? He said, Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. I said, salam wa But Imam, Imam, what's this? He goes, what do you mean, what's this? I said, minaret, banyaluka, masjid, with the quiet, I can explain it to you, he said. I said, what happened? He said, in 2002, a group of young Bosnians between the ages of 20 and 25 came together. And they said to each other, Ya Ibadallah, the genociding Serbs tried to kick out Islam from Banya Luka and there is no longer a masjid there. They said, how will we look Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the face if we meet him and we don't even make an effort to take Islam back? How will we look at him if we say that they won in ethnically cleansing Islam from Bosnia? Barakallahu fiki ya ma. Thank you ma. <laughs> So initially, the Bosnians, they raised money, they didn't have much money, and they sent a 22-year-old Imam to Banya Luka, and they told him, go and rebuild all of the 18 Masajid. I told him, but how did they let you? This is the Serb Autonomous Authority, they won't let you. He said, they didn't let us. I said, so what happened? He goes, relax, let me finish the story. <laughs> He said, we went back and there was a student studying architecture at uni. And he said, why don't we go to UNESCO and we ask UNESCO, what do we need to get them UNESCO protected? UNESCO said, you need to use 90% of original materials. Ibadallah, the Bosnians in an economic crisis, they raised money to buy 18 parking lots. They dug up the parts from those parking lots. They rebuilt the masajid brick by brick using those original materials. And they found the glass, they couldn't use it. So they found one Italian left who makes the glass. They paid over the odds with the help of non-Muslims from Ireland. They gathered money and they rebuilt it. Last year, they finished the 18th masjid. Last year, they finished the 18th masjid. They built a madrasa next to it. And they built two halal restaurants there as well. 
I looked at the Imam by this point. I thought, Subhanallah, I'm a jahil, I'm a jahil, I'm a jahil, I'm a jahil. I wasn't going to go Banya Luka because I thought I was disrespecting Shuhada. I didn't know I would disrespect the Prophet by saying that they don't deserve Islam in the way that everybody else does. They viewed Islam differently from how I did. They viewed Islam differently. They went out for the sake of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and gave everything from their money and their wealth and they went and put themselves in danger to rebuild these masajid in Banya Luka and some of us can't even go to an encampment. Ibadullah, the reason why I say this is, and I know this the point, the brief was, give us ways in which we can push our activism. But there is no point pushing activism if you haven't inherited the memories of those before you. If you haven't inherited the struggles of those before you. If you don't appreciate those who came before you who gave you the luxury to discuss these issues in a nice fancy convention hall in Baltimore. There's no point if you haven't inherited those memories before you. And there's no point if you haven't felt what the ummah looks like, ya Ibadullah. The reality is that 100 years ago this ummah was under official colonization why is it not under official colonization today it's not because the French that they left willingly it's not because they woke up they said oh la la c'est grave what we are doing in Algeria we have to live it's not because of that it's because the Algerians kicked them out the Egyptians kicked the British out the Indians kicked the British out the Vietnamese kicked the French out they kicked out those colonizing powers because they struggled because they believed in something there was an identity that they felt when they moved forward but yeah Ibadullah I finish on this point because they're putting those banners five minutes five minutes it's five minutes, five minutes. <laughs> Ibadullah, as you pursue, I'm not here to tell you what you should do. I'm here to ask you to consider a few things. Ibadullah, when we read the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we love telling the story of Khalid ibn Walid, right? He defeated the Muslims and became Muslim. And then became soul of Allah. We tell people, look at Islam, how it makes an enemy into soul of Allah. We tell people the story of Amr ibn As, about how he went from trying to persecute the Muslims to becoming the man who takes Islam to Egypt. We love telling the story, right? We say, look at our Islam, how it makes the enemy into an ally. We told so Umar ibn Khattab, you know he used to beat up Muslims because they would give the da'wah and then he becomes Muslim and becomes Al-Faruq, the pinnacle of justice. Ibadullah, has anyone considered there's a Khalid ibn Walid right now on the other side that with da'wah will become the sword of our modern day Ummah? That there's a Amr ibn As on the other side that with da'wah will come and take Islam to where you can't take it? That there's a Umar ibn Khattab right now pro-genocide, pro-Israel, pro-everything. But if they become Muslim, they are the ones who will lead us to the pig the pinnacle of justice. Has any of you considered it or did you think the seerah ended in 632 AD? When the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah ma'izzal Islam bi ahad al umarain Allah bless Islam with one of the two Umars. Has any one of you made a dua that Allah bless Islam with one of the current enemies of Islam right now? For example, Allah bless Islam with Donald Trump. <laughs> Look, but, but look at this for a second. It's true, I said it in a way that makes you laugh. But why do you laugh? Why is it so impossible? When the Prophet ﷺ is making dua for the two Umars, there are two Umars openly persecuting the Muslims. There are two Umars both beating up the Muslims. There are Abu Jahl and Umar Khattab both openly beating up the Muslims. Did, would you have laughed? If you heard the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Allahumma bless Islam with either Abu Jahl or Umar Would you have laughed at that period? Would you have laughed at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba when they made that sort of dua? And that's the point. Why is the perspective so ridiculous when in reality the seerah is telling you it is possible? The seerah is telling you people's hearts can change. The seerah is telling you that people can come to your aid. When you see those non-Muslims standing up for Gaza, despite the fact they have no ethnic ties to Palestine, no religious ties to Palestine. Ask yourselves why they are roaring for Palestine. It's because there's a fitter of roaring. The Muslims should say, this is it. Let's take the biryani and go, ya ibadullah. Let's go and do the open Jum'ah. Let's go and do the Salat. You all saw in Colombia, there was the girl with the short shorts. She puts the kafiyah as a hijab. She wants to copy the sisters in prayer. How do you not know that your engagement at this time, when they are right for the da'wah, how do you not know that this is the da'wah? Or are we Zionists in thinking that we are a chosen people and they don't deserve the da'wah? Ibadullah. is about an attitude. It's the belief that you believe the fitra will resonate with the message of justice even if they are enemies today. And this is, I want to finish with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهُ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Is there any speech than those who call to Allah, do good deeds and say they are, I am from the Muslimin. Now if you read it like a Dajjal, one eye, 
You think that da'wah is only kumbaya? It's Eid in the park, which is part of it. It's, that's a half truth. But Allah tells you what da'wah feels like. He tells you what da'wah feels like. Allah says in the following ayah, The good deed and the bad deed are not equal. Why is Allah saying good deed, bad deed are not equal when it comes to da'wah? Then he says, Push with that which is best. Ya Rasulullah, what am I pushing? I want to give da'wah. What am I now pushing against? You're pushing against the backlash that the call for justice brings. There is a sheikh in New Jersey and I tell the story everywhere. We're sitting in the car and he says to me, Sami, Islam is problematic. I told him, Sheikh Taqila, they catch that on video, you're cancelled everywhere. He said, no, no, it really, Islam is problematic. I said, Sheikh, I know New Jersey are very blunt, but this is too blunt. He said, listen to me, Salli al Nabi Am. Salam, you can tell he's Egyptian. In any case, he said to me, Sami, what was the relationship like between the Prophet and society during the first 40 years of his life? Sadiq, I mean, they loved him. The beloved son, he comes in, they leave the amana. Tayyib Yasami. Second question, when do his struggles begin? When he stands up and he says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, stop oppressing the poor, stop burying your daughters alive, liberate the slaves, give every, there is no superiority over, of an Arab over a non-Arab. Move ibadallah in this way. When do his struggles end? They don't end until his dying breath. He said, Sami, the natural state of a Muslim engaged in da'wah is one of struggle, one of difficulty, and one in which they're constantly pushing, constantly pushing back against the backlash. Ibadallah, the question was implicitly framed. How can we have the good ways of activism in which we are most effective? But I want to flip the question. How can you maintain a heart that can push through the struggle? How can you maintain a heart that pushes through the heartbreak? How can you maintain a heart that pushes through the despair. For Wallahi, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not see Quds liberated. He won in Badr but lost in Uhud. And then he had an existential crisis in Khandaq. And then he had to sign a treaty of Hudaybiyah. And when they signed it, the ayah came down. They were shaken until the Prophet and those who followed him said, when is the victory coming? We're doing all this activism. We're doing all these protests. We're doing we're doing all this social media, we're doing all these things. When is the victory of Allah coming? Know that the Prophet said the same thing, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why I flipped the question in terms of what is the attitude that you should have. Allah says that if you persevere, the one who is your enemy today, tomorrow becomes your warmest ally. But Allah tells you who achieves it. The ones who achieve it are not the ones who are not patient, are not the ones who are lazy, Allah says, وَمَا يُلَقَاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا The ones who achieve the shift where the enemy becomes a warm friend, where Donald Trump's rallies now start chanting genocide, Joe, genocide, Joe, genocide, Joe, where Tucker Carlson, Omar Adrag says we need to cut funding for the Israelis, where Macron says we welcome ICC, arrest the Muslims, where Donald Trump says we need to cut funding for the Israelis, where Macron says we welcome ICC, arrest warrants, where Germany says we will arrest the genocide, Netanyahu, if he enters our territory, when you see that Australia refuses to join the alliance against the Houthis. When you see EU restore funding for UNRWA, when Biden has to criminalize UNRWA but his allies turn against him. Who achieved this shift? Who achieved this global shift? It's not the armies that you think you need. It's not the money that you think you need. It is the ones who are patient, patient with a process that doesn't produce the outcomes at the pace that you want. But if you keep going, it will produce the outcomes at the pace Allah wants. وَكَفَى بِهِ وَكِيلًا Allah is the best to trust with these outcomes. Allah says, وَمَا يُلَقَاهَا إِلَّا مُحَذِّرْ عَظِيمٌ عباد Allah, if you plan to stand for justice, know it is a part of struggle. If you plan to stand for justice, know that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam struggled and suffered for 23 years to deliver Islam to your hearts. And that's the point I want to make, Ya Ibad Allah, when I finish here. Ya Ibad Allah, I saw a video of a 12-year-old being interviewed. He's an actor, I think, in one of these Osman series. And the presenter asks him, if you met Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what would you ask him? And the boy had a phenomenal answer. I was thinking, what would I ask him? And the boy said, I wouldn't ask him anything. I 
say to him, Barak Allah feek, ayyuhal habib. Barak Allah feek, my beloved prophet. You were boycotted, but you kept going. You were persecuted, but you kept going. You lost Khadija, but you kept going. You lost Abu Talib, but you kept going. You were kicked out of Mecca, but you kept going. You were defeated in Uhud, but you kept going. You had to dig the trench, but you kept going. You had to sign Hudaybiyah, but you kept going. And though you didn't see us, you still loved us. Though you didn't take Al-Aqsa, you were satisfied with what Allah gave you. Barak Allah feek, ayyuhal habib, for everything that you did. Because 1400 years later, they gathered in Baltimore to say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and to spread his message far and wide. This is the spirit in the hearts. Michael Hart, the non-Muslim historian, there's a reason he put Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as number one. Genghis Khan conquered more lands than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alexander the Great conquered more lands than the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But what's the power the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had that makes Michael Hart put him at number one? It is not the material achievements, though they were great. It's the spirit that he left behind that though he didn't see the da'wah being given in the English language, he didn't need to because he left the spirit behind that brings a boy from London to sit with his family and ummah in America to say, Ya Ibad Allah, let's continue shaking the world. Let's keep saying the haq. Let's keep saying the truth. Let's keep doing what's right for our beloved Prophet. Ibad Allah, Ibad Allah, know what power is. And that's the final advice I give. If you're going to do activism, know what power is. No power is not weapons. For Wallahi, the Zionists have their missiles and are bombing the Palestinians. But Megan Rice entered Islam because of the resilience of the Palestinians. That they are bombing, that they are spending millions on a PR campaign that you with your activism broke for free. Netanyahu spent millions and you broke it for free. Netanyahu lost TikTok so he's trying to ban it. Biden wants to ban TikTok. May Allah protect, preserve and elevate TikTok and preserve it for our ummah. May Allah protect. My algorithm is good. For those who think it's fitna, don't say it out loud. You'll expose yourself. I don't know what you taught your algorithm to show you. In any case, I finish on this point, Ya Ibadallah. Ibadallah. The Prophet Muhammad said, Shayyibatni Huda. The Surah Hud has given me white hairs. Why? Surah Hud is about prophets who go to their people. They spend a lifetime of da'wah, a lifetime of activism, but only minority of their people believe. So Allah destroys their people. The Prophet was worried this would happen to his own ummah as well. So, Ya Ibad Allah, would you say that the prophets in Surah Hud failed in any way? No, you will cringe. Why? Not because it's haram to say, of course it's haram. But there's another reason why. Because you subconsciously know the outcome doesn't belong to you. The outcome belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will not reward you for the outcome. He will reward you for your striving. He will reward you for your mobilization, for your moving. You may never see the outcome in your lifetime, but Allah will still say to you on Qiyamah, Ya O beautiful, blessed soul, though you didn't see the outcome in your lifetime, you kept moving, you kept mobilizing, because you were desperate for the honor of being my vehicle. I will show you what I did after you died and the outcome. Look how beautiful that outcome is, but enter my Jannah. The Prophet didn't see Quds liberated, but he didn't need to, because in Jannah one day, you will tell him the story how Quds was liberated. For delivering the message in such a way that it roared in our hearts. We broke Israel's monopoly over the narrative. Genocide Joe is about to lose, and we are seeing the world shift in such a way that Israel today is a pariah state because of your activism. Ibad Allah, know that all glory belongs to Allah. And that is the most beautiful thing. May Allah use us as his vehicles. May Allah make our hearts steadfast. May he let us push through the heartbreak. May he let us push through the despair. May he give us the wisdom to move forward. Because Ya Ibad Allah, the way I see it is, we are making them panic. And Allah said, those who do even an atom of good deed, Allah sees it. How wonderful it is to see Netanyahu do a press conference to complain about you students, to say, please stop them protesting in Cameron. You made Netanyahu panic. You made him.